who are come to listen to me. Cancer is a word which strikes fear into the heart of most people. Can I have the first slide? This term, captain of the army of death, usually used to mean tuberculosis. In the old days, it was tuberculosis in the 1700s and 1800s. If you got tuberculosis, there was no treatment and invariably you died. With the control of infection and movement, we now have lifestyle diseases taking over. And today, cancer has taken its place on the stage as one of the captains of the army of death. Next. What is a cancer? It's an abnormal growth. The growth of which is uncoordinated with that of normal tissues and it continues to grow even when the original stimulus is removed. Now, this is a lay audience, so without trying to go into too many technical terms and jargon, None of us have the original cells we were born with. Our body is constantly renewing itself. New cells are forming and old cells are dying. Now, like any mass production line, there are going to be a few mistakes on the way. So these are mutations. And cancer cells are forms of mutations. Now, normally the body's immunological system recognizes this abnormal cell and destroys it. It is only when it fails to destroy that then it continues to grow. It does this. It grows in an uncoordinated and aggressive manner. And the characteristic of cancer is that one is that it comes back if it's not removed properly, it comes back in the same place. And the other is that it spreads. It can spread either by the bloodstream to the lung, the bone, the brain, and or it can spread by the lymphatics, which are uh, fine uh, tubules which everyone has. You know, if you get a tonsillitis, you get a swelling in the neck, that is the lymph node getting enlarged. These same lymph nodes can get enlarged by the spread of cancer. <coughs> the incidence of cancer is no doubt increasing. It's difficult to quantify in India because statistics are so badly maintained. But in the West, 15% of all deaths worldwide are due to cancer. If you live in the US, one in six individuals, one in three males or one in four women will get cancer in their lifetime. <coughs> in India, the incidence has increased and 7% of cancer deaths in India are known to be due to, 7% uh, of deaths are known to be due to cancer. Next. What are the causes of cancer? Now, this is difficult to say. The assumption that causes cancer, we call it a carcinogen. There are some substances which are associated with cancer. Uh, they are called co-carcinogens. So, I see from Mr. Madhu's uh, paper here that the Reader's Digest has said that consuming too much sugar, drinking hot beverage, eating processed meat, being obese, all these are causes of cancer. They are not directly causes of cancer. They may contribute along with another factor to a more chance of getting the cancer. These are all statistics. Statistics are very difficult numbers to deal with. You know? If I say 80% will cure and 20% won't, who will come in 80% and who will come in 20% is very difficult to quantify. It's not an individual thing. It's just that on the whole, you take 100 people, we can say 80% will do well and 20% won't. But we do know some very direct causes and one of the number one is tobacco. Tobacco not only as smoking, where it causes lung cancer and it may not be as commonly known cancer of the urinary bladder. Also, chewing tobacco, which is the cause of the number one cancer in India, which is oral cancers. In India, chewing tobacco 
when it is the beetle leaf and the uh, beetle nut which contributes it, it coacts with the tobacco to cause cancer, oral cancer being the number one type of cancer in India. Now, little digression over here, there is a thing called Pan Parag and the <coughs> scented tobaccos. That tobacco is more dangerous than anything else because it's marketed as a social, something which can be handed around and eaten socially. What it does is it causes a condition called submucous fibrosis in the mouth where you are unable to open the mouth. And I have seen school children coming with this condition. And the submucous fibrosis is a pre-malignant condition. You, people with submucous fibrosis are very, very likely to get cancer. Not only will they get, if you treat that cancer, they get another cancer somewhere else in the oral cavity. So it's a very, very disabling and morbid condition. Radiation, of course, nuclear radiation. We all know that after the atom bomb were dropped in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, the incident of cancer was high. Many of you may have seen a program called Chernobyl on uh, Amazon. Chernobyl was where the nuclear uh, plant exploded in Russia. And following that, the incidence of cancer of thyroid all over Ukraine, Kiev, and uh, that area of Russia increased manifold. In the old days, they actually used radium to paint the watch arms. And they hired these girls to paint the radium, which would then glow in the night, and we could all see it. And they would dip the paintbrush in the radium, lick it to make the tip fine, and then paint it on this. Many of them develop cancer of the jaw. So, you know, it's it not only uh, an occupational hazard, it can be uh, <coughs> then solar radiation. In the old days in the West, they all lay down on the beach without any clothes to get tanned. Then they found skin cancer, the incidence went up. So today in countries like Australia, there are big educational programs to get people to cover up. Do not go and expose yourself to the sun because actinic radiation can cause cancer of the skin. We are lucky, we are dark skinned, we are resistant to the actinic radiation effect on our skins. It more on the fair skinned people who do not have melanin in their skin. Chemicals, one as I told you like the radium, the other was pitch blend, Asbestos, which is why asbestos, such a wonderful compound, is now banned almost all over the world because people who work with asbestos inhale the fine powder and develop a very complicated cancer of the lung. Physical, repeated trauma from sharp tooth in the mouth can cause. In Kashmir, because it's cold, they carry a pot of coals under the gown, the, the woolen gown they wear, and that is kept near the tummy. And this is called a kangri. Many of them develop kangri cancer because where that hot bowl of charcoal to keep them warm sits against the skin, over a period of years that skin changes and they get cancer over there. When chimney sweeps were necessary to clean the chimneys in the west. These children had to climb up the chimney and clean it with brooms. And the soot, the black stuff which is inside the chimney, would coat their trousers. And the incidence of cancer of the scrotum was very high amongst chimney sweeps. Trauma, uh, as I told you, the sharp edge of the teeth rubbing against the tongue. Infection. Infection is really not a cause of cancer. But there are certain viruses which are associated with cancer. In Africa, there is cancer called Burkitt's lymphoma, which is caused by an Epstein-Barr virus. Closer to home, there is human papilloma virus, which is associated with cancer of the cervix. 
and in Southeast Asia with nasopharyngeal cancer in the throat. Genetic. Nowadays, this is the big thing, genetic. When we talk about genetic, there are two parts. One is familial cancers, which can be inherited. The gene is inherited from generation to generation. And the other is that there, there are things called tumor suppressor genes and tumor accelerator genes. The tumor suppressor gene is the one which kills the mutations, awkward mutations. Now you can picture it as a car. Normally to control the car we have an accelerator and we have a brake. The tumor suppressor gene is the brake which controls the multiplication of the cells. If this packs up, you're in a car which has got a working accelerator but no brake. The result is abnormal multiplication of cells and cancer. The tumor, the other one is the tumor accelerator gene which works like a the brake is there, but the accelerator is now out of control. It doesn't matter how much you press the brake, this car is still racing ahead. So, the genetic factor is coming, causing cancer. Next. There are certain well-known pre-malignant conditions. One is familial polyposis of the colon. Small growths within the colon. Not very common in India, but very common in the US, which is why there they uh, advise men over 50 to have a regular colonoscopy so that these polyps can be picked up and dealt with. The oral submucous fibrosis I mentioned earlier in connection with Panparad. Leukoplakia is white patches in the skin, of the mucosa or the oral cavity. These come from various causes, smoking, spirits, syphilis, like that. And this leukoplatic patches will eventually turn malignant. So like this, there are many other pre-malignant conditions. One thing is that cancer cannot spread from person to person. It's not like an infection. You can't touch someone and give him a cancer. You can't cough in his face and give him a cancer. Even if he touches, let's say it's a growth on the uh, arm and he touches it, nothing happens to him. Cancer is a collection of diseases. It's like infection. There's no one infection. There are a variety of infections and many different types of infection. Tuberculosis is there, syphilis is there, urinary tract. They're all different. Similarly, cancers are also different. There's no one type of cancer. Depending on the tissue from which it arises, it has a specific name. And therefore, the treatment of different types of cancers also varies. Within each type of cancer also, there is a difference. So, for example, breast cancer in young women is very aggressive type of disease. In older women, after menopause, it's a more benign form of disease. It's cancer, but it's not as aggressive. So, the treatment is very different from, let's say, a pre-menopausal woman who has cancer and a post-menopausal woman who has cancer. Now, this is a benign, we, we divide all tumors into benign and malignant. A malignant one is a cancerous tumor and a benign one is one which is not cancerous. This is a benign swelling of, of the thigh which is excised over there. That yellow stuff is fat. This is a tumor of fat and uh, can it become malignant? If it's left long enough, yes, rarely they do turn malignant. Next. What are the symptoms? The commonest one is a lump, which so as surgical oncologists very often call ourselves lumps and bumps surgeons. I had a patient who went to Tirupati and he shaved his head. And when he shaved his head, he noticed there was a small swelling on the skin on the top. So he went to see his GP. He said swelling on things, sent him to a neurophysician. That type of swelling on the scalp, that's a very common condition. It's a cyst, it's a severe cyst. Go and see Dr. Thomas. So the chap came to see me. But when I saw it and I felt it, I could feel that the bone underneath was also, had been eaten up. So it was not a simple cyst. So I sent him back to the neuro people saying this is not a simple cyst, this is 
likely to be something in your line. So when they took an X-ray, they found the bone underneath was completely eaten away. So back he comes to me and saying, this is malignant, you better deal with it. So I did a biopsy. Now every lump must be biopsy. And if it is taken, anything which is removed, you must send it, I won't say you, we must send it for examination under the microscope. And this gentleman's swelling was sent and it turned out to be a cancer which had spread from somewhere else and we could never find where the primary was. So it was known as an occult primary, a hidden primary. All these things are known you know, where you, the patient presents with only the spread of the disease but and they are unable to put a finger on from where it has come from. Abnormal bleeding. The commonest ones are bleeding in the urine, blood in the stool, uh, abnormal bleeding amongst women from the vagina, vomiting of blood, coughing up of blood, all these are uh, indications that something is going on, it's not to be taken lightly. Persistent ulcer, and ulcer particularly in the oral cavity, which doesn't heal in a reasonable amount of time with standard treatment, must be looked at suspiciously and preferably biopsy. Fever. Now there are a number of causes of fever and most of them are due to infections. But there are some few fevers which are caused by malignancies. Cancer of the kidney can present with fever. Uh, leukemia can present with fever. Lymphomas can present with fever. So fever which uh, kind of remains for a number of days, number of weeks, should be looked at a little more suspiciously then just pass it off as an ordinary fever. Blockage of a tube. There are a number of tubes in the body, like the eating tube, the gullet, they can get blocked, so you have difficulty in swallowing. The tube from the gallbladder can get blocked. You get jaundice, the patient presents with jaundice. The intestine can get blocked, presents with intestinal obstruction, inability to pass stool and platelets. How do we move on from here? The first thing is the clinical examination. Nowadays, more and more, we seem to rely on the investigation. Do a CT scan and come back. No, but the first thing is we must. One of my colleagues brought his mother, 70 year old lady, who had a lump in the breast. And he said, I had an FMEC done, which is a type of biopsy, and it's negative, but. Uh, Dr. Thomas, just have a look and see. The moment I put my hand on it, I knew this is not just a benign lump. Malignant lumps have a certain feel to them. They are hard because there is a lot of calcium in them. They, they, there is a certain feel which over a period of time, surgeons come to know. I said, no doctor, this is not a simple thing. Let's take out the whole lump and subject it to histopathology. And sure it was, sure enough, it was a cancer and we operated on the lady and she is doing well. <coughs> the next, after clinical e examination, we come to imaging. In the old days, they were just x-rays. Now, there is a ga wide gamut of various methods of imaging. You have plain x-rays, you have CT scan, you have MRI, you have ultrasound. And the most useful one when the cancer is concerned is the PET scan. That is the one which emits uh, radioisotope and can be picked up. And of course, those of you who have read Arthur Haley's final diagnosis knows that the final diagnosis is made by the histopathologist looking at the tumor under the microscope. Everything else is hypothesis. It looks malignant. Oh, it looks benign. No. You've got to take it out, look at it under the microscope and then only know definitely that yes, this is malignant or no, it is not malignant. Next. Here is a quote from Hilaire Belloc in the 18th century. Physicians of the utmost fame were called at once, but when they came, they answered as they took their fees, for this disease there is no, for there is no cure for this disease. Things are not so bad nowadays, we all know people who have had cancer and have survived. But it varies. It's very difficult to say who will survive and who will not. Treatment has improved. 
drugs are much more available. Next please. <coughs> the treatment varies. The, the fundamentals of treatment are surgery, radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Previously all were done independently. The surgeon would say, I am going to operate. The radiotherapist would say, no, no, I think we will give uh, radiation. Or the chemotherapist may say, first we give a couple of injections, then we will see what happens. Actually, the best method is a combination. No one method is able to cure all cancers. And take an example of breast cancer. Uh, anyway, before we come to breast cancer, let me tell you that as many as oncologists as they are, each one if you ask will give you a different answer how to treat any cancer. If it's, this is the problem with diseases where there is no definite method of cure. Unlike, let's say, you get tuberculosis, we know INH, streptomycin, this, 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 these blood drugs will cure you. In cancer, it's a little variable. Now, <coughs> surgery has its advantages and disadvantages. Surgery is quick. Unfortunately, it is mutilating. Let's say you have cancer of the tongue. Half your tongue may go, maybe all your tongue will go. There comes the radiotherapy. He says, no, I can cure your cancer without mutilating. You'll still have a tongue and you'll still function. But the best is where you can remove the tumor and then radiate to control whatever which may have been left behind. So surgery at one time, you know, the treatment for cancer is what they call radical. Radical means be aggressive was removed more and more. So let's, let's take again, again an example of cancer breast. Uh, before they just removed the lung, then they came to removing the breast, then they came to removing the breast and the underlying muscle, then they came to super radical surgery where they would remove the breast, the underlying muscle, the nodes from above the neck, and still the results were the same. Not that everybody got cured. Today with the combination therapies of radiation, chemotherapy and surgery, we have gone back to less and less. Today for most breast cancer, surgery is conservative. We just remove the lump uh, with a generous uh, portion of the tumor around it, of the breast around it, and then give chemotherapy for six weeks, and if it's a largest lump, maybe give radiation also. Immunotherapy is the current buzzword. As I said, it is the body's natural response to recognizing a cancer is for the body to destroy it. So there is immune boosting drugs which boost the general immune system of the body and there are specific targeted immune uh, medicines which are specific for certain cancers. Next. Now here is a cancer of the jaw. This is actually, that's, your, that's the tongue over there. And next to it, that white and red thing is a cancer arising from the gums. Obviously, to do a rare operation where you remove everything, you've got to remove the mandible also. So next. Here we are. That's the upper jaw. The lower jaw where that tumor was is removed. And we've also removed this area in the neck. That is where the, as I told you, the tumor spreads. So you've got to remove all that. Now, after radical surgery like that, you don't want to leave an uh, ugly looking hole in the person's cheek or you um, obviously deformed face and so on. So we have reconstructed the jaw with a metal plate Thank you. Re reconstructed the jaw with a metal plate you can also do these reconstructions differently you can take bone from the leg and put it so it looks more natural but this is uh, a simple thing to put a metal plate next and this is at the end of the operation you can see the shape of the jaw and the appearance of the patient is more or less normal. That 
the shape of the insertion is placed in such a way that the scar is minimized. So even though we are malignant, removing a malignant tumor, we try our best to keep the uh, deformity or the appearance of the patient <coughs> as normal as possible after the surgery is over. <coughs> Next. Shakespeare said, diseases desperate grown by desperate appliance are relief or not at all. And cancer is truly one of those conditions where no pain, no gain. You, have, you treat it aggressively, you are likely to have good success. You be gentle with it, the cancer doesn't, there is no respect for gentleness. It, it grows very explosively. Next. Now here is a, another patient. This lady used to go for walks very often. And one day she noticed that there was pain on her leg. So she went to see the doctor, the orthopedic doctor, and he took an x-ray of her leg. And you see this white, white, this is normal. But here we found something which is dark. And this was suggestive of a tumor in the bone. So they sent her for a PET scan. As I told you, one of the many scan, PET scan. And this is her right kidney. The right kidney had a big growth. And it had spread from the kidney to the bone. Bone to kidney is, you know, these things are known. Bone to kidney is rare. Whereas bone tumors we know from the lung, from the kidney, from the thyroid, from the breast. These are all known to spread. So when we were not surprised when we found the tumor in the kidney. Next. So first we remove the kidney and this is what I meant by radical operation. This brown, this is the kidney. Around it is the surrounding fat. So we remove not only the kidney but all the normal surrounding tissue so that we know that we are not leaving anything behind. And this is the, the kidney is now cut open and this is the tumor in the kidney. That one which you saw there bulging out. This is the outside appearance. When you remove the tumor, you must not see the tumor. Then you know you've done a good operation. Next. And there was that tumor in the bone. So we went in, this is the edge of the bone, we cut the bone off and we put a metal rod inside to give support and stabilize the bone. This, this operation, this patient was treated more than a year ago. She's now fine and she's uh, walking around quite happily. And then one of the many success stories of aggressive treatment. Next. No guarantee. <laughs> Having said all this, unfortunately in the treatment of cancer, there is no guarantee. As I said, first thing I said was statistics, 90% will do well, 10%, you know, it varies from cancer to cancer. So unfortunately, who will be in that 10% and who will be in the 90%, we are unable to individualize. And so we're going to tell you, there is no guarantee of cure. There is five year survival. We never say five year cure. Five year survival, ten year survival, even fifteen year survival. That means even fifteen years after your cancer has been treated, there's no guarantee that it won't come back. It can come back. And uh, next. I think that's all. Thank you. I'm happy to take it.